I couldn't necessarily bring in that information and just start providing some of those services because I was part of a much larger ecosystem. So I definitely felt that frustration where I was like, oh my gosh, we can treat these people so much better. And I can't, like I'm limited because I've just got to get this done. So after this is over, maybe we can be a little bit more open to that and I can show and demonstrate that actually by paying attention to some of those numbers and show how we can connect that to patient care, that this information can empower you to treat your patients better. So the, the more successful hygiene department you can have and hygienists who understand this, that's when you're going to have more profitability. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists. This is episode number 201. What, what? And we're still here. Uh, my name is Andrew. <laughs> and this is Michelle. And all of my raspy gloriness. That's an amazing voice. I love <laughs> sick voice. Man, this is rough. For your new listeners that just decided to tune in to this one podcast, this is not how I usually sound. This is the best you'll ever hear her, though. <laughs> So I'm less pitchy, <laughs> less pitchy, yeah. more squeaky. Yeah. Maybe we've got a really interesting, I think it's a virus. I think we've zeroed in on, um, patient zero in my life, which is my friend KP who, um, freaking KP. I know it was funny uh, because her sister who she was with the weekend before I saw her got this very similar thing. And then a, another friend of KP's got this. And it's all, it's like all of a sudden we all lost our voices, like out of nowhere, didn't feel bad. And then like two days after losing our voice, then we started feeling bad. Mm. So, so I think the moral of the story is if any of you know, KP, you need to use O2 me. nose filters <laughs> yeah. anytime you're around her because she is patient. Wash zero. your hands and use your nose filters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But it, I was just very happy that, um, so I was this weekend in Toronto. I got this on Thursday, Friday. I had zero voice, but talked to not a soul. Like anything was like, even just me, me, by the way. Yeah. You called and I was like, nope, can't talk. Can't talk. <laughs> I drank all the world's lemon water and honey and presented from 9am to 4pm on Saturday for the hygienist at the Ontario Society of Perio, and they are sweet and smart and engaged and awesome. Mm, the Can't best audience. Enough about them. I know. They were a real joy. Wow. It made it a lot easier to feel kind of yucky and having this to talk to them because they were so engaged and asked so many good questions. I mean, can you, are you honestly surprised? Like, you think about the people that we know that live in the Toronto area, like, they're oh, really yeah. smart people, right? Yeah. Like, come on. Very much like the Washington hygienists that I always say are yeah. engaging and have such good questions and open to ideas and just really believe that they'll they'll never know it all and they can't ask enough good questions, you know? Like that's the <laughs> hygienist that I love Me working too. with the most. Me too. So they are awesome, good people. And hello to Gabriella who took me out to downtown Toronto. She's a fan of the podcast. Thanks for that. <laughs> so we have some exciting stuff coming up. We have uh, Greater New York is coming up soon. Gosh, I can't believe that. We were just there. I know. It, that's what I was thinking. I was talking to someone the other day. I'm like, how many times have we been to New York? Was it really 12 months ago? So I know. It's, it's yeah. crazy. But yeah, Greater New York. We also have the EMS 24-hour webinar coming up. Yeah. So guys, this is a really cool thing. It's the first ever 24 hours of webinar where you can get 24 CE credits in one day. It's going to be start. It's like global too. It's, this is a worldwide event and EMS who is uh, the, uh, had the most amazing uh, biofilm management equipment out there, which is uh, the airflow. You've heard um, a few of us talk about them on the podcast before 
but they're going to be hosting this. It's going to start on November 23rd. And we are excited because some of our faves are on there. Mm -hmm. So the great Karen Davis, who you just heard recently, Trisha O'Hare, who has been a repeated lovely guest and one of our um, big, well, we're one of her biggest fans, I should say. (laughs) Also, uh, Debbie Z, uh, that you've probably heard her name out there in the world because we can't ever say her last name correctly. So we just say <laughs> Debbie C. I can't remember what her episode number was. I, I was trying to think of it real quick. I was like episode number like 30 something. I feel like we I had Debbie Z so on the podcast on. so, so early on. All of these people like have been really good about being on the podcast and stuff. So uh, show your love for them as well by going to the the website, which is 24 H as in 24 hour, 24 H dentalwebinar.com. And that's on Saturday, November 23rd. Yep. The numbers 24H. And you can also go to our Instagram page or our Facebook page. We have like a little countdown. You can click that countdown in our Instagram story. And it'll actually remind you guys, BT Dubs, if you didn't know that was a feature, when you see a countdown in someone's story, if you click it, will actually remind you about that. I mean, Good job. I know Andrew's like, totally wait, what's a story? That. Yeah. You don't even know what a story is. Well, it's when someone says like a long time ago in a faraway oh, land. It's like your bedtime story. No, exactly. No, sorry. That's, that's what I know to be true. Um, and for a uh, greater New York, let us know um, that if you're going to be there, there's quite a lot of events that like maybe you could hang out with us at. So let us know if you're going to be there. Send us a message on Instagram or Facebook or um, at our uh, f- our website, at tale2hygienist.com. Excellent. Andrew, you're going to really love this one. You were not with me during this interview. This is Josie Sewell, who has been on the podcast before, like at least two years ago. We talked to her at RDH Under, Under One, one Roof. roof. Yeah. She has since been out there doing amazing, amazing things in the world of dentistry And I think you're going to be really enlightened and inspired by hers as usual. Like anytime you meet Josie, you're enlightened and inspired, but you know, I don't love business. You know, I don't love (laughs) metrics. This is nothing new to anybody who's been listening to the podcast. I embrace it because I see that it's a necessary evil, but I really hate it. However, I will say she highlighted some very important things that we as dental hygienists need to understand about our metrics and our production. And it, so it was fascinating. So I really do think you will enjoy this. I'm sorry that you couldn't be there with us, but you are going to all enjoy this message and podcast episode from Josie Sewell. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So I want to take a minute and Welcome Josie Sewell back to the podcast. You heard her. I'll be sure to put in the show notes the last episode that she was on, but God, that was like two years ago at least, right? I know. I can't believe it's been that long. Yes, probably. I I can't either. Um, It was an amazing podcast and we really do need to revisit autism in the dental offices and treating um, patients with autism. But do do you know the story, Josie, that... um, we have a listener who heard your podcast and I think it was within the next week or something like that, saw a patient with autism and used all your tips. And the mom actually came back and was like, that was the best appointment that he had ever gone through. And now she's actually using them in her, like to communicate with her son. Oh my gosh. That's so like, I literally, did we not tell you that? I know. I think that maybe I happened to come across it but like just hearing it again i'm like oh my gosh you just you just never know it's just amazing so i love the platform like that you guys have created so that stuff like that happens and connects us all you know i agree i agree and this time you're going to be on we're talking something different um from dental hygienist to the things that you're doing now and then we'll kind of just get into our topic because as it just a preface to our this interview is that we're talking about kind of the business side of dental hygiene, which makes me incredibly awkward <laughs> and uncomfortable. So I know I'm going to learn a lot today as well. So tell us your your journey. 
Absolutely. So 2015, my husband and I actually decided that we needed to provide better resources for our son who has autism. So on a giant leap of faith, um, we packed up and left our hometown and everything that we knew. My husband quit his job of 10 years. Like he was um, on a senior leadership team and he was overseeing like 30 locations and 75 sales employees. And we gave it all up to, to find stuff for our son. So we ended up moving, moving to the Pacific Northwest and I found a job, um, as a uh, professional development manager is what it was called. And so it was a company that, um, we would pull data from practices and I was on a five function team and we would all sit down with our different like expertise and look at those numbers and then provide guidance to the dentist and help them become better leaders. And um, so that's where I got started into more like practice management consulting and understanding really the business of dentistry. And so during that time, um, one day the CEO came to me and he said, hey, I'm going to give you a couple of my VIP members. They're not super happy right now. They're really, really important to me. I need you to do anything that you can to make them happy. And I was like, yep, sure, you got it. And at this point, I was on a team that specialized in multi-location practices. So um, I end up getting on this welcome call and there are these two crazy dentists on the other side and they're super fun and they're super charismatic and we just connect right away. So I end up attending their leadership meeting virtually every week for like six or seven or eight months or something like that. I read all the books that they're reading. I learn their process. I'm training their people. And so one day they called me and they said, Josie, what would it take for you to come to North Carolina? We want you to be part of our team. <laughs> and I was kind of like, I loved them so much. I was like, you had me at hello sort of a thing. So we moved my family from Washington State to North Carolina to be part of Carolina's Dentist. I came on the executive leadership team, um, and I've, but I've been in many different seats. So I've been the director of hygiene. I've been the director of people or HR. I was director of operations. And so right now I am the chief operating officer of a um, $40 million dental group. We have nine locations. Um, seven of them are scratch start de novos. So they are practices with our brand on them. We built them from the ground up. So they've done um, seven brand new scratch start buildings in six years. And so the company has grown really, really, really fast. And we recently, and we're getting a little talking a little business talk here, but we recently, um, about a year ago, decided to um, find an investment partner. So if you're super unfamiliar with the way that groups work and what it is, you have DSOs or dental service organizations, and they are the large groups that you think of like Heartland, Aspen, Pacific, Smile Brands. Um, and then you also have people coming into dentistry who recognize that um, there's money to be made in dentistry. And so you have private equity firms that come in. So private equity is people who have, you know, they have investors. Some of them use different types of like, it just depends where the money comes from. But private equity firms might have businesses in lots of different industries. So lots of private equity firms are coming into dentistry and so they will purchase practices and, you know, continue to grow them. But once you get into private equity, then, um, you know, those investors want their money back eventually. So it ends up that um, you end up going through that again, where you go through a transaction. So we just completed um, a really, really big merger and transaction with a group in Virginia called Lightwave Dental. So in the last year, what I have seen about what it takes for acquisitions and for diligence and the negotiation process and what the closing looks like and transition looks like, it's just something that most of us just don't ever even consider inside, you know, when we show up and go to work every day. So that's been really, really educational for me. But I am in a um, super fun transitional time right now. I love Carolina's Dentist and I've put my heart and my soul into this place and I love the people. I just love my team members so much. And even on like the worst day, never once did I wake up and not want to go to work. And that's not like being cliche or kidding. I mean, you've, right. you've, you know, you've been to CD, you know, it's a great place, a super special place. 
Yeah. Um, amazing. So the Google of dental offices. Yes, it is. Um, but you know, in North Carolina, I mean, the reason that we left four years ago from our home was to provide for our son with autism and he's not getting what he needs um, there in North Carolina. And not only that, but living on the other side of the country, it's been super hard for my family. Like, you know, it's not enough for me to see my mom twice a year. It's not enough for me to see my brother once a year. And my kids, we were just always so used to you know, my kids every Sunday being surrounded by family. And um, we lost my mother-in-law earlier this year unexpectedly. And we just realized again that life is too short for us to not be living the life exactly that we need. And so I've become friends with everybody at Dental Intel and especially with Weston, um, the CEO. And so he reached out and um, had an opportunity um, that he would love for long-term to create an industry recognized certification program that like office managers can go to, to understand how to run the business better, how to lead and manage people better. So not that they know how to use dental Intel better. Of course they would do that, but how to be less overwhelmed to serve their people better, to serve the business better and um, to get that off the ground. And that was something that I feel like of all the experiences that I've had, I feel like I'm really, really uniquely qualified and able to create learning experiences and curriculum and training so that it helps people, like it leads them to behavior change. So rather than it being like, you're going to do step one, step two, step three, I'm that's not me at all. But first, I want you to think about this and consider this, and then I want you to do this. And, and so just a much different look at it. And so I've taken the position as the VP of education for Dental Intel. And so we are moving from North Carolina to Utah in the beginning of November. I think we've moved seven times in six years. Gosh! And so for us, like we have a house and it's under contract and it's in the most adorable little neighborhood in America. It's in this like master plan community. There's a giant park that's going in and there's all these walking trails and a pond that's going to be a skating rink and a swimming pool and a gym and like just tons of kids everywhere. And so um, I found out that one of my DI coworkers lives in that neighborhood. And I was like, tell me about it. He's like, oh, well, you know, last Sunday we had a cookie walk. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, like you make cookies. And then you come out and you're like cruising around the neighborhood meeting your neighbors. So um, super exciting for my kids and my family. And there's an in-law apartment in the basement. And my father-in-law is going to move from Farmington to Utah and he's going to live with us down there and have his own space, and um, which is going to be amazing for him, for my husband, who's stay-at-home dad, for my kids. But especially like my son with autism, he has 10 words verbally that he will say. Grandpa and airplane are two of them because he wants to get to grandpa. Like he takes and packs my suitcase all the time. And I'm like, no, buddy. And he's grandpa, grandpa, airplane airplane let's go airplane i'm like oh, buddy i'm sorry so to give him that and it is just like so breaks awesome. your heart every time <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely so that was a very long story to say that in the last four years i've just been immersed in the business of dentistry working with very large teams and a large organization you know we have Over two, now we have over 200 employees at CD. And how do you create clear expectations for every single person in their position and what's their priority? And a lot of that has to do with what we're going to talk about today with just how do we measure things? How do we look at things? How do we make it objective? So I'm super excited for what we're going to talk about today. Well, and, you know, I appreciate your journey because while you're telling me, my question was, have you like, so when you started as, you know, graduated dental hygiene school and went into a practice, did you have a more propensity towards the business side, the measures, the objectives? Because for me, I'm more like implementation of the science, you know, like, and then the moment somebody talks business to me, my mind shuts down. But I definitely now see after doing this podcast for four years, how important it is to understand um, the business role and the measures, measurements um, of of what we need to do. How do we make sure that we are being successful and that we can continue to provide to our patients? Because if we can't make the money, we can't buy the supplies and we can't 
sure. see the patients. Yep. So have you always had that like, like drive to go learn the business side of it? You know what? Like, it's great that you asked that question because no, I mean, I very much was like, I loved, you know, just the, I feel like I was a little bit ahead of my time in many of the other, like the offices that I was in or the other hygienists that I was around because I did have such a love for the science. And so like, you know, I was using perio tray, perio protect perio trays back in like 2012. I did training as a myofunctional therapist back in 2012. Girl. (laughs) (laughs) And so, no, I, I loved it. It was actually just, um, me take and I you know what I but I will say that understanding the science I did start to feel even though I worked in amazing offices I did start to become really frustrated because I felt like there was so much more that I could do and I could provide for patients but as being part of somebody else's business it was tough because they were still dealing with everything else. And I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily bring in that information and just start providing some of those services because I was part of a much larger ecosystem. So I definitely felt that frustration where I was like, oh my gosh, we can treat these people so much better. And I can't, like I'm limited because I've just got to get this done. So no, it, it didn't come until I needed to learn it. And that started when we were in Washington. One of the things we're going to talk about is why we should measure our performance. And when I ask that question, for me, the performance side of things makes me super anxious because it takes me back to hygiene school where I think you're going to like pull out an explorer and check for calculus or disclose my patient and grade me. So, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> that's, that's not what, what we're are the measurements <laughs> that we're talking about and why should we be concerned about those? So first, let me say that where 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 is tough is there will be people listening that you know are coming to this and listening and they are very of the very very strong um opinion that if we care about numbers or we care about what those things are or we start measuring our performance that we will be over diagnosing and over treating or that we do not mm-hmm. care about our patients and what um i really hope is that after this is over, maybe we can be a little bit more open to that. And I can show and demonstrate that actually by paying attention to some of those numbers and show how we can connect that to patient care, that this information can empower you to treat your patients better. So, um, you know, it's tough when I start talking about numbers because it can be such a polarizing, polarizing topic. So you have to go about this delicately, right? And talk about what's important. So I think, you know, if we think, if we step back a little bit and talk about why metrics or numbers even matter, you look at what's happening inside the dental industry. And so you look at whether that is insurance companies that are significantly, um, you know, making it really difficult to get reimbursement, but also they're just not paying enough. So you have insurance companies driving the cost down. You have the cost of just running a dental office and the technology for owners getting so much more expensive. So even if we just take radiographs, for example, where years ago before we had digital radiographs, it was a few cents to pay for a film, right? And now what you have is a $15,000 sensor. You've got an $8,000 Nomad or, you know, whatever it is. You've got the computer program. And yet we're re- patients are really not paying any more per se for that x-ray. And so just, you know, if we, we look at technologies helping us treat our patients better, but the cost of that is just crazy. Then you also consider that dentists, just like hygienists, they come out of school knowing how to be a clinician. They're a great technician, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. So they know all about teeth. They know nothing about HR. They know nothing about having to go through in finances and managing their business. And so, so many dentists, you know, they don't even know, like I can ask dentists, tell me what the profitability rate is in your practice or whatever. And they're like, I honestly Uh, have no idea, (laughs) right? And so um, what's tough is that I, you know, I do some coaching outside of what I've done. And so I've met some incredible dentists who have allowed me to see inside their business and get to know them. 
And what's tough is how hard it is to keep the lights on, how hard it is to make payroll. And so you have a dentist who, you know, is trying to, they get out of school, they've got $500,000 worth of debt. They purchased a practice that is, you know, $700,000, $800,000. They're now over a million dollars in debt. They don't understand the business well. They've got a hygienist who, you know, is asking for more pay, right? Mm -hmm. They've got assistants asking for more pay and unemployment rates are so low that it now takes 40% longer to hire somebody than it did before. So there are so many outside things that are really driving the complication of dentistry. And then you have groups coming in that have money, right? And they have the leverage of being able to scale. So they're buying up practices and sometimes, you know, you have, you have amazing groups and then you have groups that unfortunately it's people who understand money or finance or business, but they may not understand dentistry and they might be, you know, pushing down on the wrong things. So as hygienists, you know, we're very much like kind of in this really unique position to where we are providers, we are clinicians. Um, and the things that we can bring to a practice can help make or break a practice. So um, when you start looking at the business, what a lot of people don't realize is in the hygiene department is really where the profitability of the practice comes from. So what I mean by that is that um, it takes the dentist doing an incredible amount of restorative dentistry to be able to pay for basically the bills, to keep the the building paid for, to keep the supplies coming you know, to keep payroll made. And so oftentimes the hygiene department, whatever you can get out of your hygiene department is often that's what your profitability is. So the the more successful hygiene department you can have and hygienists who understand this, that's when you're going to have more profitability. Now, you know, a lot of people, when they hear me say profit or talking about how profit profitable an office can be, They think of profit as a bad word. And so I know everybody's like, yeah, I get it. You know, this is a business. We have to pay the bills. But like one example that I love to give is like, can you remember a time that maybe you were in college, right? And you've got your pay, you're going to college, so you can't work a ton and you are so broke, you're living on ramen noodles. And so when you're living on ramen noodles and you're looking at your bank account every single day, because you know, if you get that Starbucks coffee, you're potentially going into the red. Or if you forgot which day you put your Netflix subscription for, and it's going to come out and you're like, oh crap, I'm going to get a $25 overdraft fee for my $8 Netflix bill, right? And so if you think about when you're in that state, how creative are you? You're not right? No, you you can't think about anything but yourself. You can't serve others. You can't go out and do those things. And so just like that is for us individually, multiply what you feel like your expenses and your debt and your responsibilities are to what a dental office is, where you have 15 people who come in bright eyed and bushy tailed that are counting on you to make sure they can feed their family. And if you don't understand the business well, or you're not profitable, you can't be creative. You can't lead people well. You can't support people emotionally because you are a mess. So trying to connect that what the dentist is going through and as team members, we overestimate how much is actually going to the dentist. We think we see that they had, you know, that this is going to be a $1.2 million practice this year. And we are positive that the dentist is taking home, you know, all of it. All of it. When in fact, <laughs> they are taking home maybe $120,000 a year or something like that, right? So um, we have so much unique opportunity as hygienists to understand the business, to support the businesses that we work for, the people that we work for, and our patients. As far as like, how do we measure the business? Obviously, like, Profit really comes down to if you're just looking at one word, and that is basically money in versus money out. Are we actually paying the bills and have anything extra left over? But as a business becomes more profitable, they can serve their community better. So I always tell everybody, if there's no margin, there's no mission, right? And so whether the mission of that practice is to simply provide an amazing place for these team members to come to work, or if that mission is 
to help people live longer, happier lives by taking care of their oral health, or they want to go on a mission trip or whatever. So if there's no margin, there's no mission. So connecting that to if we have that margin, we can serve our community better. We can do some free dentistry. You know, we can go out and do this, see the people in schools. We can do lots of other things. So that was kind of a big ex- explanation just to like bring us back to, you know, the, the, the big picture. So <clears throat> when you start looking at an office, you're going to hear words like production, collections, adjusted production or net production. You're going to hear all these things. So um, what's tough about dentistry is, again, with the reimbursement rates. So gross production is simply the amount of dentistry we've done in dollars. But you have something called a usual customary fee. That is your full fee. So let's say that the UCR fee for a pro fee, let's we'll just make it easy and say it's $100. Okay, so somebody does a pro fee. And so we have $100 in gross production. Well, gross production is actually kind of like fake money because we're not ever going to really see all of that money. So then you have write-offs or adjustments based on working with insurance. So if you're in network with an insurance company, then they can say, sorry, we will pay you $75 for a pro fee, even though $100 is your fee. If I'm in network with an insurance, I can't ask the patients for that additional $25. But if I'm out of network, then I can ask the patient for that extra $25. But so many of our patients won't go to places if you're not in network with them. In network. Right. But they end up, you know, just kind of making it super difficult. So first of all, from gross production, you have um, adjusted production or net production is basically like taking off that adjustment from that 100 to that 75, right? So then you also have collections and collections basically is the money into the practice that we actually got. So in some cases where you have, um, let's say, a procedure that has a patient portion and an insurance portion, well, did the patient actually pay the, all of their patient portion? Did we actually collect it? Did the insurance pay what they were going to pay? So once you shake all that out, the money that actually comes in is the collections to the practice. So you will see, depending on the, the practice, what the gap is between gross production and those collections. So for example, in my offices, it varies just a little bit because we utilize the mil- we where we're, you know, one of my practices is right outside the entrance of a military uh, base. And so 80% of my patients in one practice come from military insurance, the family's insurance. And that insurance, it is awful what they do to, you know, um, just the rates and things like that. So sometimes we only collect about 56 to 63% of what our usual fee is. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine I have to overproduce and do a lot of production to try to bring in enough collections to cover the expenses of the business. Right. That was a really great breakdown. So how does that work? This is a little digression from the topic, but insurance coding, and because that's always a big thing about, oh, but the insurance isn't going to pay for that perio maintenance. It's going to pay for that pro fee. And hygienists are just want to, you know, do what's right for the patient. They're going to do that perio maintenance, but they're only going to charge out that peri or pro fee. Do you have any advice on that? Because I'm sure that's going to affect the bottom line as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, I mean, I definitely did plenty of free stuff because I was like, insurance isn't going to pay for it. Like, does it make a difference if I'm really scaling two millimeters down or four millimeters down? Like, yes, it's a little more work, but like you, it feels like every kind of wrong to not get to the base of the pocket, right? Like, Every, every little fiber inside your hygiene genetics is like telling you how, what, like, and why do we always go worst case scenario? Oh my gosh, there's going to be a perio abscess. I'm destroy this, like this, like anyway. So I think that what comes down to that 
is because we don't understand the business, because we don't understand some of the metrics and things like that, we actually don't fully appreciate the value of the services that we offer. So if we truly understood and we were okay with saying, the value of what I offer you is worth this amount of money, you know what I mean? Like that, that is valuable. And it's so... I think that we forget how valuable it is what we do for patients. I think that also we take on the emotional burden of people's choices. And I think that we have to just step back and say, you know what? And I, but I also think that we have to be better with our communication and our language. I think that hygienists need to stop apologizing for somebody having perio. Like, You know, when I go and I listen and I will hear hygienists say, well, you know, you've got a little, got a little bit of bleeding back here and, you know, you might want to think about doing something and, you know, whatever, like we've got to be direct because we're not doing our patients any good by like beating around the bush. And we need to elevate ourselves and to be able to say, you know what, you have bleeding pockets, you have infection in your mouth, you have a bacterial infection in your mouth. And the way that we take care of this is by doing this procedure. And as your hygienist, I recommend that you get that done as soon as possible. If you want to be healthy, then you need to get this done. And then um, when they say yes, or they say no, we need to respect that choice. And we need to do what the patient has asked us to do. And hopefully they come around. So We talk a lot about it at Carolina's Dentist, and this is a little bit controversial, but I'll tell you my opinion on it. So hopefully I don't get any hate mail, but we don't do um, like declination forms where like if I come and I say, let's say you're my patient and I say, Michelle, you know, after doing your assessments today, we, you know, were you aware that you had some infection in your gums, right? And you're like, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, well, that's called gum disease or periodontal disease. I have lots of patients that have it and they don't realize it. it's kind of like high blood pressure. You don't realize it, you know, until it gets to a certain point. And so what I would recommend is that we're going to do something called scaling and replaning, right? And we're going to break, like, you're going to walk them through and, um, or even say, you know, actually, before you even tell them what you're going to do, you'd say, you know, you have this infection. Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, you know what? A lot of my patients also were not aware until they came, you know, and we did the assessments. This ultimately, if left untreated, can lead to you're going to have bad breath. You might have eventual tooth loss. This can affect your arterial health later down the road. If you have a history of like heart disease in your family, like you go through all of that. And then you simply say, does this concern you? And if they're like, yeah, it concerns me. Great. Then what I would recommend is that we're going to do four quadrants of scaling and root planning and we're going to do perio treat, like whatever your treatment plan is, right? And if they say no, then a lot of a lot of people will basically bring out a form and be like, well, like you're not smart enough to make your own decisions, right? You're not smart enough to just do what I told you to do. So now you have to sign this form and now I'm going to make this relationship super weird And now what have I done? Like I potentially have exited them from the practice and I'm sending them somewhere else, right? And now they're embarrassed and now they're self-conscious and now they're not going to go anywhere else likely and they're going to sit on it, right? And then they're just going to go and start having their teeth extracted. And so um, what I have my hygienist understand is that your license does not depend on whether or not people say yes to you. Your license depends on whether or not you appropriately assess, you document, and you explain it to the patient in the way that they understand. So when they say no, we're not going to make them feel bad. We're going to respect their choice. We don't like it. We don't want them to say no, but I'm going to simply say, you know what? Okay, I I understand that that's your choice. I want you to know that I know you're not concerned about periodontal disease, but I want you to know that I am. And when you're ready, what I would recommend is that we're going to do this, this, and this. And then unfortunately, you do a profi. But what you do is we know that dentistry is so much relationship-based and relationship-driven with our patients that chances are they might just feel like you're overselling them or they're sitting there and they've got kids at home that are struggling 
with schoolwork and they've got bills they can't pay and they've got all of these other things. And so it matters in just saying, you know what, when you're ready, we're here. And what you see and what we see inside our practice is around that third recall exam, patients start saying yes. And so they just might not be ready right now. Readiness happens over time. So we don't do the declination forms. We do a great assessment. We document it. We share it with the patient. But you know what? Unfortunately, yeah, they're going to do a profi on somebody who needs scaling and root planning. And I know that that feels wrong. But again, like, I hope I'm not going to get hate mail after this. Like, it's just one person's opinion, you know. But, um, you know, I like my question to my hygienist is true or false. Less plaque and less calculate calculus now is better than just leaving it all there. Well, and I also think if you start to integrate things like biofilm management from the powders, and that is significantly better than the quote unquote profi where we polish and, you know, like put some floor down and call it a day. Like if we could do true biofilm management, even in a profi, I mean, if we, just getting them in some, a little out of dysbiosis, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's better than nothing at all because, or education. I think honestly, even more than a profi, if that patient needs full on patient education, home care management, and that would be way better than most things that we could accomplish in that appointment. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, I think that we want to solve it today and we want to make it go away mm-hmm. today. Yeah, we do. And sometimes we, do. we have to put in the time and the effort for the relationship so that they end up do trusting us. And, you know, and so what's going to happen when they leave that visit is they're going to remember that we talked about bad breath or we talked about bleeding or we talked about teeth, you know, getting loose or we talked about whatever. And they're going to talk to their mom who has dentures and it's miserable, or they're going to talk to their friend or somebody's going to like hand them a mint and they're going to be like, Oh, wow. Yeah. You know? And so eventually they will come around, but it's such a tough thing. But anyway, so we went way off of, you know, measurements and and numbers, but that's what, this is why I love this podcast so much Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you can digress, but we'll come back to it because my question is you mentioned earlier that sometimes when we look at numbers, we get that icky feeling that we don't care about the patient. And I think that that comes around too, when we talk about commission-based, because I think in that same vein of um, if I have a patient that doesn't want to do a SRP or non-surgical care, that affects my commission. And do we start to lose sight of that patient? if we are commission-based? Yeah, so great question. So I was always like completely anti-commission-based or if I make more, if I do more. So I know that you guys have them on the podcast often and we're all friends, but so Sarah Thiel and I sat next to each other in hygiene school. And this girl is like my third cousin, we found out, which is awesome. So it was when Kat and Sarah were still in Farmington and Kat's husband is a dentist. And Kat was going on maternity leave with her second daughter. And so Sarah had been there. They, she had been working, doing accelerated hygiene and had been on like commission-based stuff, whatever. And Sarah's always actually been more attuned to numbers and things than the rest of us were. And so anyway, I went in and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do, you know, I was kind of temping at the time. And so I did maternity leave for Kat. So I worked there for a couple months or whatever and thought, okay, like, I'm going to see what this is like. So it's two columns. They had an amazing assistant and um, she actually ended up going to hygiene school. And so my, my appointments were staggered. So the patient were still there for an hour, but it was like every 30 minutes for me. And so, you know, the assistant would go get the patient, bring them back, do the medical history, do the blood pressure, get the x-rays, what I did was what I had only I could do as a hygienist, which was sit down and assess and scale, right? So number one, I found that I actually became a much better hygienist with my instrumentation and just my efficiency and whatever, because I had to focus on that. So I was like, it was amazing how that experience made me a much better clinician and made me really look at just like the little things that I would do that maybe were wasting time. But what I also found and really what changed it for me is like I was one that I 
I kind of hate, I hated doing sealants. I don't know why. I just like, yeah, we all have that one thing. They, right? they stressed me out until I found the sealant that it didn't have to be completely dry. And then I was like, I'll do sealants all day. You know, you have to have the right product. Yeah. But what I found is that when I was on that like opportunity for that commission based pay, it was like, I found ways to hustle and make it work. So any other situation, if I was just paid hourly and I had like a squirmy six-year-old, I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm out of time. So why don't you come back and do that sealant? Or maybe we'll catch it next time, right? And I found that when I knew that that was a possibility, I made that sealant happen, right? And so I realized now looking at it and what I understand about patient behavior is by me doing it in one visit before they walk out the door, because once they walk out the door, if I didn't make the appointment or if they end up canceling that appointment, the chances of me getting them back in decrease significantly. And I'm saving the patient time and money by getting it done in one day. So it was like, I was actually doing more sealants. I was actually talking about fluoride more because I had gotten to the point where I just like actually wasn't really talking about fluoride, even though I should have been. And I'm not saying, what I'm not saying is doing fluoride for people who've never had a cavity and don't need it. Like we, what you realize is when you start looking at numbers is that we allow this like insurance mind to dictate how we're treating our patients. Why are we not offering a sealant for people who are at high risk for cavities, even though they're an adult, but they have a couple of natural teeth that don't have you know, fillings in them? Why are we not talking about fluoride more? And so um, I think that one, I am not against commission-based pay because I realized how it changed my behavior and how it motivated me. Because let's be honest, we all get lazy, especially when you're like, you're in a busy office and stuff becomes super monotonous. And it's like, you're just like, yeah, all right, I'm just going to scale some calculus and make another appointment, send people on their way when you actually are paying attention to those things where we all think I'm a great clinician, I am making my recommendations based on what my patient sees. And then when you pull it up and actually measure yourself objectively and see how many sealants are you doing in a month? How much fluoride are you offering? How often are you actually doing perio? What we realize is we are getting really used to doing bloody prophies. We're getting really used to seeing that four or five millimeter pocket. And we're like, oh, it's not, you know, it's not. Yeah. So I think that it keeps us more aware is one thing. Well, it, unfortunately, it's the bad apples that turn commission base into the a pejorative description of what we, you know, how we're getting paid. Um, because you have those people who are going to offer fluoride to the patient that's never had a cavity, super low risk, just because it makes money. But I think that also, now, as you're saying it in my head, I was like, okay, that's also a really great way to go back and look at your performance for health. And if that patient really did need sealants, did they get healthier? Did we decrease their influence or their risk assess or risk? I guess, Canberra, like if we're practicing actual Canberra and delivered it. Cause yeah, sometimes we do get lazy. <laughs> we really do. We're hustling and we're tired and mm -hmm. we're, we mm -hmm. lose focus a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, but you'd mentioned kind of looking back at your numbers and stuff. And so to in the last like, you know, 10 minutes or so of this podcast, I would love to talk about what am I even measuring? Like, what should I be looking at in my, am I, am I pulling reports? Am I talking to my office manager? Like, what are these things that I need to be doing if I'm comprehending all the things that you're saying today and a little bit more motivated to understand the business side of it? Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, first of all, where we find them, I'll come back to that one, but what are the types of metrics that we can be looking at. So you can look simply at like your production and many offices might break that down into what is your production per day or your production per hour, right? Um, or just what did I do in a week or in a month? Um, then, so you have production and then you can look at, you can start to break down production is, um, comes down to two different things. It's your number of visits, how many people you see and your production per visit. So if you think about it this way, what I don't, what I, what I'm not fond of is how much we're seeing that 
people are trying to increase hygiene production by increasing just the number of visits. So having that double column, you know, cramming it in, shortening appointments to 45 minutes, like my hygienists work a single column. They have one hour for a profi. They have an hour and a half for two quads of SRP. They have an hour and a half for a new patient. So I am of the opinion, like I don't want to shorten that hygiene visit. I think if you have an amazing assistant and you can do something where you've got great help, you can do it. But I am not of the opinion of just cramming in more visits. So that's that's number of visits, right? And so how many people am I seeing? And then production per visit is what am I doing with each person that sits in my chair? And so I would rather people focus on production per visit. So, um, and that's things like, do I have an opportunity to do a sealant where a sealant is needed? Am I offering fluoride to patients who need it? Am I trying to do like salivary testing or perio trays or whatever? What's amazing about when you start looking at numbers, especially across a team, is you start, you're going to start identifying where people are really good at certain things, right? And help, you know, share and whatever. So Lacey, you work with Lacey, right? She's yes. awesome. Lacey is one of my hygienists and she's been with us for several years. And Lacey is one of, she's she's been my top performing, at least in the top two or three for the last three years. Often she's number Jockey. one. And so, yes. So Lacey's production per visit is uh, like Lacey can, I mean, I've seen Lacey do a $10,000 wow. week, right? And that's a really, really big week. And so you look at somebody like Lacey and you start to ask the question, Lacey, what are you doing? Lacey loves the art and science of hygiene. So she's become incredible with being able to get patients to agree to do an oral DNA test or agree to do perio protect. Like she will send me a picture and it is a stack of like six oral DNA tests that she's sending out. And she's like, here's my Monday, right? And I'm like, Lacey, you're incredible. Like, what are you doing? And so having Lacey help me write our hygiene manual and include, you know, what that communication is to her patients, I'm now helping other hygienists practice, you know, better with their at the top of their license. So production per visit is super important. Also, what I, the other metric that is so important that hygienists need to be paying attention to is their reappointment rate. Um. So we know that it's so easy for patients to get lost in the cracks, right? And so, so many hygienists are, they think that they're reappointing everybody. And so my recommendation is that you do it in the operatory before they even go to the front desk. I don't, I, I like our hygienists, they don't say, oh, you know, can I reschedule your next appointment or would you be interested? They simply pick a day and a time six months from now that's similar. So if it's Tuesday at 10, I'm going to pick a Tuesday at 10 and I'm going to say, Michelle, thank you so much for coming today. I loved having you. Remember, you're going to want to make sure and focus on that back lower right where you were missing. Make sure I'm going to let you know as soon as we get this and this back. Um, I went ahead and I made your next appointment for, you know, Tuesday, whatever, because I assume that this day and time is appropriate for you. When it gets close to time, don't worry. We're going to give you plenty of opportunities to reschedule because you're going to get an email and a text message if it doesn't work for you. But your oral health is important to me and I don't want this to slip. So, you know, does this work for you? So you have to make an assumption that they're going to make the next appointment and you need to use language to make sure that they value that appointment. Now, you know, sometimes you can say like, oh, if you don't want to just pick a time, you can say, oh, you know, is this day and time typically, you know, what works best for you um, because I've got this available. So we just try to get people on the schedule because what happens is six months comes, they're going to get their email. They don't actually want to call and reschedule. So they're going to end up coming and making it. So you want your reappointment rate to be 90% or more. And that is super important. Now you can start to really break down and look at like, what is my perio percentage? It's what a lot of people look at. So if we know that what 50% of people over the age of 30 probably have some, some form of perio, of perio yep. right? Is that, yeah, some form of perio. Then if you look at your perio percentage, like, and it depends on what 
software you're using and how it's calculating that. Um, but it might be, let's look at the number of visits that you did in a month. What percentage of those are some type of perio code? If that's like 5%, how like five percent right like how does that match like what kind of magical office did you get into where no one has perio right and so and that's fascinating because you'll start to talk to hygienists and they're like no like we really do a good job with perio and we're really taking care of it and i'm like okay five percent does not match the prevalence rates of of the disease so unless you're seeing what what utopia are you living in Yes. So, and I think that that's what's hard is you can show numbers and we typically, like if we're just going by what we think we're doing, we all think we're getting like a hundred percent case acceptance and that we're doing a great job. And so looking at your numbers at first can be kind of hard because you're like, oh man, like I really thought I was better at this, but you just start to pay attention to it. So you can pull reports out of the different practice management software Um, and take a look at it um, is one way that you can do it. So obviously I've used dental Intel for the last three years. I can't do my job without it. I I actually never get into open dental inside my practices because I have to remote in and it's whatever. So um, anyway, so dental Intel, it's a software, right? It connects to the practice management system. And what it does is it pulls all of the information out of whatever system that is and it puts it into really easy to use, easy to understand dashboards, including like it'll have a reappointment rate for hygienists. And let's say that yesterday or last week they did 70% reappointment and we want it to be a 90%. With a click of a button, it already gives me the list of patients that I didn't nice. reappoint. Okay. And I can go, go back and find it. So yeah. So anyway, obviously I love dental intel and I think that it's awesome. It's super affordable for practices. This is not a dental intel pitch. But if we start talking about numbers and metrics, it um, just makes it so much easier to understand. And then like there's tons of different other metrics that you could super dive into. But as far as the hygienist is concerned, what are my what's my production, right? Like what am I actually doing? Um, How much fluoride or sealants am I offering? What is my percentage of my perio and my reappointment? Um, I have our hygienists pay attention to their production per visit and their reappointment rate. Those are two metrics that they report on every single week and they have benchmarks for them. My question or my thought, and you know, I think what has triggered me in the past. So if those were things that were required of me, I would have been more stressed out because um, I think in a certain practice, when you aren't valued, your actual, the, the, the patient care isn't valued. And then you're being asked to give you these measurements of your performance. There's a lot of contention and animosity that develops in that. Um, So do you have any thoughts or advice on ways maybe to help people kind of overcome that? And and by that, because I am absolutely that hygienist. Like I've been there where they were like, what are your goals? I'm like, dude, I'm out here like surviving my day. And now you want me to give you a production benchmark or something. And it makes me very bitter but they also weren't giving me my, um, I guess, need, they weren't meeting needs, my 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 human needs as a hygienist. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, so two weeks ago, Dental Intel had, it was called the Mastery Summit. And I was speaking as part of that. And that was actually before, you know, we had agreed that like we, you know, we were working towards getting to work together. And so I actually taught a presentation to around 170 coaches and consultants on how to help teams understand and get behind data and metrics. And so what I will say is what I love about Dental Intel um, and just the people that they are and the reason that I'm like, yeah, I want to work with you is because when I first started with them, you know, when they're doing their coaching and training with people, they make it absolutely clear that you should never, ever use data as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the, the way that they teach people how to use it, it's always three celebrations to one area of opportunity, right? So number one, like you're going to have people, dentists that are scared and they're confused and they're struggling to run their business and they are probably going to rule by guilt and fear. That's not a place where any of us want to be. And so I think that understanding the numbers and understanding what you're capable of, what the office is capable of, empowers you to be able to have those tough conversations to say, 
you have a goal for me, but like, in, like, you know what I mean? If we're just completely blind and don't understand the numbers and we're in a place where they're ruling by guilt or fear, they can use that over us. But if we understand the numbers, we're comfortable with it, we're comfortable talking about it, then that that can help empower us and help us make a good decision whether or not we should be there. But what I will say is in order for to use something like metrics or whatever, you really have to have positive team health. So you have to be in a place where you can be open, honest, and vulnerable with each other. You trust each other. And there has to be, we all have to be on the same page and aligned to why we're pushing for those numbers. Like if we're just pushing for those numbers for the sake of the money, nobody wants to be in a place like that. But if we're pushing for those numbers because we are trying to challenge ourselves and make sure that we're taking good care of our patients and we're aware of our you know, habits and abilities and skills as the clinician, then that's great. So, you know, it, it, it can be really scary to look at numbers. It can feel like you're handing somebody something over you, but you're handing them power when you don't understand them yourself and don't know how to affect them. But it, it again, like it's super tough, but you can't successfully utilize these things unless you're in a good team. Wow. That was so perfectly explained. Thank you. So as a final like tidbit or advice, so we have a lot of hot new new grads, students, and we've recently learned that we have some people that are like changing careers later in life and they found the podcast. So they listen mm. just to yeah. know what it's like to before they get into school, which I think is so brilliant. So smart. Any advice um, on the business side of dental hygiene for those students that are about to graduate, new grads, or people that haven't even made it into the program just yet? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we have to respect and recognize that dentistry as an industry is different than other healthcare industries. So a lot of people will try to take business principles or things that they learned in other places and simply apply it to dentistry. And that's sometimes where they struggle. And so we have to be open to the fact that dentistry is just unique. And I think that even if you are not somebody who every week knows what your numbers are or is watching those things or setting very specific goals for yourself or the practice helps you set them, just understanding it will give you more confidence, including where, you know, hygienists will come and they might say, I need a raise or I want to get this powder thing that Michelle's talking about. You should get that for me, Right. Right. Being able to understand the numbers, I think that hygienists could be so much more powerful if they could understand and be able to talk about things like numbers or metrics or business. So for me as a hygienist to be able to say, you know what, I've increased my production by, you know, 10% from this year to last year. I'm doing this and this and this, and I've brought this much to the business. Now, the next thing that I can do to take myself to the next level is to be able to utilize this technology or this instrument or whatever. This is how it's going to help my patients. And I have, this is how I think it's going to affect my performance. And this is what it means for you as a dentist. Like when you can come to the table with that level of information and speak confidently, there's no argument in that. But when we say, I want this thing because I think it's going to help, I don't know how much it costs. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, it's usually my approach. I'm like, yeah. I, just want it. <laughs> I just want it. Like it's fun. It's new. I'm going to do it. Give it to me. What's the problem? So, I think that if we can get better about quantifying things, then we can justify things and we can influence and push for things. So, even if like you're moving from one place to another and you've been really, really successful, when I have somebody who can say, I implemented a new perio program and we increased our seeing our, you know, our perio percentage by 10% after we increased it and it brought the business X amount of whatever. I will pay that person and do whatever I can to get them inside my organization because they already know. So especially if you're looking to get out of the operatory, whether that is sales or teaching or consulting or whatever it is, you have got to get better about understanding the business behind it and what levers move what in the business so that you can come prepared. Because that is where I see many hygienists try to take on an alternative career. And then they end up going back to hygiene is because they allow themselves to get stuck 
this is going to feel so awkward. You're not going to know. You're going to look and be like, I did 1200 today. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that you just have to start and you just have to be consistent and watch it and see what you can do. That's awesome. So if anyone has um, more questions or even wants to maybe get involved with um, in Dental Intel, um, where can they find you? Awesome. So um, Hygienist in Heels on social media, right? So whether that's Facebook or on Instagram, you can email me, hygienistinheels at gmail.com. Um, and so, yeah, please feel free. If you have questions, send me a message or whatever. And I'm happy to answer that and happy to support you. And, um, you know, this is something that I can super geek out about and talk about and love it. And I think that it's this really intimidating mystery to hygienist and they want to know, but they're not sure who to ask. So please ask me. I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer any questions. And you do such a beautiful job of making it um, understandable relatable, but also acknowledging the fear and the the problems that the hygienist could be going through and how to work through it. So I do appreciate that so much. I've learned a lot and I actually, um, I wish I could go back to the offices where I was like a giant pain in the ass about business <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. redo that because I think there would have been a lot more success for um, my practice and my patients there. But thank you so much again for coming back on. And this is an early morning for us and we're both kind of congested, but <laughs> thanks so much. I know. For... Sorry about that. Voice. I know. And luckily they won't see us on video because they'd be like... Yeah, because oh. we're like in sweatshirts and like morning hair. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I love it. Awesome. Well, this has been super fun. So I, I hope that people find it useful. We just kind of grazed over, you know, some of that, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we've, we actually were going to talk about this last time. And then we ended up just talking about autism. So two years later, I'm so glad we got it done. Sorry it took this long, but we're glad. No, to be back. but also thank, thank you, so, you much. so much, Josie. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, if you didn't appreciate metrics before this, I have a feeling you are going to appreciate it now. And this probably doesn't like the title read or the description read is something that was like super interesting, but you probably found it to be. So share it with your friends, like go and tell them how good this was and how enlightening it was because um, not everybody is uh, as into listening to it on a routine basis, I think. So yeah, yeah. this is a, a good way to remind them that um, this, how good this was. Well, I think that Josie also, the way that, the way that she um, is able to deliver the information is something that's engaging and interesting and fun. And you want to learn from her. I mean, and a big congratulations to her. She was just up on the stage at one of the major DSO conferences down in Florida um, just this past weekend. And from what I hear, she just killed it. She's highly sought after in all of the dental business space. I think she even just took a new job with uh, Dental Intelligence, I think is the name yeah. of it. And she so, talked about that in the podcast, too. Man, congratulations to that. That's just, uh, she's just amazing. So um, thank she's you for being on, human. Josie. Impressive human being, for sure. And if um, you want to get CE for this course, check the show notes. And thank you to PDT Dental and to CE Zoom for providing a CE credit for this. If you haven't tried out, actually gave two PDT instruments away at this course in Toronto, um, the Queen of Hearts and the Jack B. Nimble, which is like Montana Jack's little brother. Definitely need to check those guys out and um, tell PDT how much you appreciate them sponsoring the CE portion of this uh, little old podcast. Um, and also uh, thank you to Lacey for always doing all of the hard work of putting the CE test together. She does an amazing job and I don't think we recognize her nearly enough for being the amazing and intelligent human being that she is. She's so perfect at it too. She's just got that perfect little brain for creating these tests. Um, and uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram or you haven't already, we would love for you to do that. We are we started a new segment on Instagram every week called Science Sunday. That is to bring you scientific articles and break them down for you. So you don't have to go out and read them. We're appraising them for you. Um, they're things that we believe are going to be relevant to you as a clinician. So check it out. I would love for you to share that out in the social media world as well. And we're also doing something called Chairside Chat in our Instagram TV. 
Um, currently, that is sponsored by Tepe Oral Healthcare. And so if you wanted to learn a little bit more about their products, check out, well, the website, tepeusa.com, and then our Instagram TV. And if you have not already, go and subscribe to our newsletter. I think they're getting more interesting. Um, it's a nice little recap. And we just encourage you to like us also um, or subscribe to us on iTunes and review us. We love those things the most. They're helpful. Mm-hmm. We're have another. We're going to have a nice uh, review here coming up next week. So it'd be fun to read that one. Perfect. And if you haven't already checked out the Dental Podcast Network, Channel 1 and Channel 2. You got anything on that? Do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Channel one, channel two, another network for you to be as current as possible on all kinds of dental topics. So thanks for everybody listening to my raspy awfulness and tolerating this and, um, you know, always tolerating Andrew's awful voice. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's what people know about me. Andrew and your awful voice. That's what I get oh, all the time. You do all the time. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a great week. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all.